How are you doing today? Um, not so well. I mean, why else would I come to the a &E at midnight? <laughs> yes, you do have a point. So, according to what you reported when you checked in, you are experiencing acute chest pain. Is this the first time you've had this type of pain? No. I've experienced occasional stabbing chest pain over the last two years, but it usually goes away fairly quickly after a second or two. And has that pain been in the right or left side of the chest? Um, it's usually on the left side of the chest, but sometimes the position changes. Hmm. Generally, cardiac pain lasting a second or two is not significant. So what about today's acute pain? Uh, when did it start? It started about four hours ago at 8pm and has been persistent since then. It is here, in the centre of my chest. And what about other symptoms? Are you experiencing shortness of breath or heart palpitations? Nothing like that. It does feel a bit better when I sit up and lean forward. OK, I see. Speaking of feeling better, did you take anything for the pain? Um, yes, at 9pm, about one hour after the pain started. I took two paracetamol, but it didn't seem to make any difference. So, let's just talk a bit about family history. Do you have any history of cardiac disease in your family? Yes, my dad had a myocardial infarction at 51 and also had a high cholesterol level. Hmm, well, that certainly increases the risk of heart disease, but I see no other risk factors evident so far. OK, so have you had any other illnesses recently? Um, yeah, about two weeks ago I had an upper respiratory tract infection that lasted for about four to five days. What symptoms did you have at that time? The normal ones, you know, sore throat, blocked nose, sneezing, also a really bad cough. The whole house was sick with the same thing, my husband and two kids. So, I've taken a look at your electrocardiogram, and I think I have an idea of what is going on. You said that your pain gets better when you sit forward. This indicates a type of pain originating in the pericardium, the membrane that encloses the heart. Those two things combined with your recent upper respiratory tract infection points to pericarditis with a viral etiology. Hmm, OK, so what is that exactly? Is something wrong with my heart? So, pericarditis is swelling and inflammation of the membrane surrounding the heart. In many cases of pericarditis, the cause is unknown, but one common cause is viral, which can be caused by a cold or pneumonia. So, is this serious? I mean, will I need to be admitted to the hospital? No, I'm not recommending that you be admitted at this time. There is some risk for bleeding into the pericardial space, but for now, I'm going to recommend rest and NSAIDs. Y How are you today? I'm doing okay. Uh, nice to meet you. So, they tell me you've just had an accident playing football. Do you know how long ago the accident happened? Yes, just about six hours ago. I crashed into another player. They tell me I hit the right side of my head against his knee, but I don't remember any of it. He must have jumped pretty high for his knee to hit my head. Mm, yes. I can see here that you then fell to the ground and were unconscious for 20 to 30 seconds. So you continue to experience amnesia about the event. Yes, I mean, I remember running towards the guy and then uh, nothing. Black. But then I woke up later and felt absolutely fine for a while. I mean, I was chatting with the nurse and trying to convince her to let me go home. So after you arrived at the first facility, you had a generalised motor seizure and were given lorazepam to stop it. And I can see the CT scan done then was unremarkable. I can see now that you are having slight psychomotor slowing and some slurred speech. This may be because of the lorazepam. How are you feeling in general? Um, I'm a little nauseous. Also, I have a headache, but... I mean, that is probably to be expected, right? I mean, I hit my head. Hmm, maybe. But I want to get another CT, a non-contrast CT of the cranium, and to keep you under observation, as deterioration can be quite rapid in these cases. In what cases? What do you mean deterioration can be rapid? You described a lucent period before your seizure, which is a classical presentation of an epidural hematoma. Also, the fact that you then had a seizure and are showing a downward course with more neurologic problems is another sign that concerns me. And the symptoms you just described to me are also associated with this condition. OK, but what is um, an epidural hematoma? An epidural hematoma refers to the accumulation of blood between the inner table of your skull and the outer dural membrane, which is the outermost layer of dense connective tissue surrounding your brain and spinal cord. This condition is generally caused by a traumatic event involving a blunt object, such as getting hit in the head by someone's knee while playing football. It often results in an overlying fracture of the skull, it is the blood vessels in close proximity to the fracture that are the source of the hemorrhage or bleeding. I do need to tell you that there are other possibilities. What other possibilities? Are they worse? Other possibilities are a subarachnoid hemorrhage and subdural hematoma. For these two, a lucent period is not expected, but the CT will help us to determine what your condition is. For now, the most likely diagnosis is epidural hematoma. Does it mean uh, permanent damage? I mean, will I be able to play football again? I mean, my mum is already going to be pretty upset with me about this injury. 
Um, generally not, because the underlying brain is usually minimally injured. Prognosis is excellent if we treat it aggressively. Also, you were brought in right away, which increases the chance of a good outcome. Of course, it also depends on what type of epidural hematoma you have. As for playing football again, we can talk about that later. I really hope I can continue to play. I mean, I'm not that good, but I love the game. Mm. Like I said, we can talk about that later, but first... You could do much better describing bronchiolitis than I've just done, given that I've been out of the game for so long. You are essentially correct. Bronchiolitis is a respiratory illness in infants. It affects the very small breathing pipes in the lungs. It causes difficulty with the lungs, so the babies breathe quickly, their chest sucks in, they have difficulty feeding and they may need oxygen to assist them. So that's what the disease looks like. And it's caused by a virus, the respiratory syncytial virus. Yes, about 50% are caused by the respiratory syncytial virus, and 50% by groups of other viruses. And why do some babies get it and not others with the same infection? Yes, that's a good question. There are a number of risk factors for children to get more serious illness. Bronchiolitis can be a very mild illness in some. In some it's a serious and potentially life-threatening illness. There are a series of risk factors such as parents that smoke in the household, such as previous prematurity, cardiac issues in the baby. So there's a number of risk factors. Also being indigenous, from whichever country you are in, is a risk factor for more serious illness. The premise of your paper is that there is a lot of what's called low-value care going on in bronchiolitis which means hospitals, pediatricians, are doing stuff, and it's just a waste of time and money and maybe even harmful. Yes, that's exactly right. We've known for some time, and there are a large number of international guidelines that assess the literature that tell us that there are a number of interventions that are frequently made, and in Australia they are made depending on where you work, in 25% to 50% of babies will get one if these interventions that we know doesn't help, such as they get inhalers or puffers that we would use for asthma, such as salbutamol or ventolin or adrenaline or aprotropium bromide. All they would get routine chest x-rays, which are also unnecessary. Okay, and what's the right treatment? The evidence we have to date, that the treatment we have that works is supportive care. So we need to actively manage the child. So let the baby heal him or herself and just give oxygen if the baby needs it and that sort of thing. Yes, good nursing care and good care to help the parents look after the child, feeding if necessary. Sometimes they need assistance with feeding, so whether that be intravenously or via a nasogastric tube to assist with the feeding and oxygen if necessary, and obviously in the more severe cases, other measures to help the child breathe, and no antibiotics. No, correct, antibiotics have been shown not to be helpful in any population. So you were trying to reorient 26 hospitals towards a higher value care, in other words towards that kind of treatment. What did you do? Yes, and as has been shown many times, it can take many years to translate research into evidence or into clinical practice. So we took 26 hospitals. Half of them we just gave the guideline and said, you can go away and do what you would usually do with this which is prop up the door with it or something, prop open the door usually. Yes, we didn't actually ask them what they did, but yes, it may well be nothing useful, correct. The other half we partnered with and we had a series of interventions, including people from their pediatric ward and their emergency department, doctors, and nurses who became champions or leaders at that institution. We worked with them to develop educational materials that they could use that were targeted at the medical staff, but also targeted at the parents because we've realized that one of the drivers for some of the interventions is the parental expectation that we would do some of these tests and so on or give some of this medication. So we did that and we provided them with feedback along the way. We measured how they were going, provided them with feedback over the year of the intervention, and allowed them to compare themselves with the other 13 intervention hospitals which has been shown to be quite an effective way of improving that, so you don't threaten them, 
In a confidential way you say you say, well, you're doing well or you're behind the average compared to the rest of the hospitals. Yes, that's right, it provides incentive and encouragement. And what were the results? Yes, the results. Showed that the 13 hospitals where we made the intervention improved their care about 14% more than the non-intervention hospitals. So our previous research had showed that the baseline was around about 50% of children getting one of these interventions. During the study we actually found that probably only about 30% of the children were getting the interventions, so there had been some improvement already. But on top of that we were able to make a 14% better improvement by having these targeted interventions, which is probably at the upper limit of other research showing. And did the babies do better? In both groups the babies did well. The length of stay in hospital was pretty much the same, so they didn't do better but they certainly didn't do any worse. It seems extraordinary that you've got to do that with highly trained people who have passed their medical and nursing degrees that you've got to do all this to get the right treatment. Yes, and I'm sure there are listeners who are thinking why do we have to do this? But when people are used to doing something and it has been part of the care for a long time, getting people to stop doing something, especially when we are asking them to stop making interventions in most of the things that they've been doing for this is actually difficult. And we needed to frame it in the way of we don't want you not to do anything, we just want you to do something different. And so we had to frame it that not just stop but actually what we need to do is support the child and the family. Let's hope it sustains itself. Thanks. Ed thanks very much. Our next project is to see if we can sustain it. Good, we'll get you back. No worries. Professor Ed Oakley is Chief of Critical Care and an Emergency Physician at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. So, Quite an extraordinary effort there, Tegan, to get evidence-based care in place. Yes, and so important because bronchiolitis can be really, really terrifying. Yes, absolutely, it's not what- See a lot of people with osteoarthritis, as well as inflammatory arthritis, which is what rheumatologists primarily do. But there's always been a lot of interest, and of course in how to treat osteoarthritis because there are increasingly lots of effective treatments for inflammatory arthritis. Everybody has a expectations as they should do about returning to normal function. The progress of treatments into disease modify, if you like, so if we are treating inflammatory arthritis, we are looking at stopping the process that causes damage. And with osteoarthritis, if you take the medical focus there is joint damage. That is at least partly mediated by inflammation but the treatments that we use for inflammatory arthritis, these don't seem to be as effective. Although there has been some overlap, sometimes not entirely consciously because people with inflammatory arthritis and osteoarthritis have seen some benefit from some of the treatments that we use. But when you actually target them in clinical trials, there aren't convincing benefits demonstrated. So a lot of the focus has been more on the treatment of pain. This is quite high benchmark and one interesting comment that came out from one of our conferences was that actually getting authorization to conduct trials in pain for osteoarthritis is quite tricky. Because in order for for example, US drug licensing, bodies to license treatments for osteoarthritis. They often require that any drugs used can show a difference in mortality which is really quite high benchmark. And so, unfortunately has led to a lack of investment in this area. But in the recent American College of Rheumatology conference, there's been big noise about a drug called 10 News, a MAP, which is an anti-nerve growth factor antagonist. And this seems to be quite promising. Showing that symptomatic osteoarthritis actually correlates with NGF. That's growth factor expression and it does seem to be that this is likely to be a big topic. There have been quite a lot of trials of neuropathic pain agents in osteoarthritis, and I think there's no real clear results of benefit. But we all use them pragmatically because I think in clinical practice, you want to help people control their pain and feeling control and return to normal function. So, 
In addition to into analgesics and disease-modifying drugs, is there anything further about exercise and sort of other non-pharmacological treatments mentioned recently? Well, there are strong recommendations for aerobic aquatic neuromuscular, strengthening exercises and conditional recommendations for balancing training yoga, CBT that's cognitive behavioral, therapy, acupuncture and the bracing. So I think they're really quite broadly but I think one of the things I've seen as a rheumatologist, so a non-exercise specialist is that increasingly the terms around exercise are becoming more closely defined which I think is a good thing because again, going back to the point we made in the podcast about using the same language, a lot of exercise terms are used by everybody in every field now and we need to be more precise about what exercise means. I think that's something that we've seen, and some other, what we've talked about and that we need to define what the intervention exactly is, but also to find the dose that we're talking about. So it's so the frequency and the intensity and I think that's, that's something that's sometimes, made it difficult to compare outcomes or different studies, you end up comparing apples with pears, don't you sometimes you do your day? And I think when people have quite understandably real keenness to get back into the activities that they love and they are very knowledgeable about, if you can use the language of that activity, even to that sport, it brings confidence that they can return to that. Something I saw when I was a here to this, it talked about how people stick to physical activity and exercise much more. If it's part of their sort of normal routine or part of something else rather than a prescribed series of exercises, which I suppose makes sense, doesn't it? But that adherents think it was much better. So I think that's a ledger. Tease. All right, here to better than sort of individualized specific exercises. And that's going to link into the episode that we've got coming up on aging athletes with Professor Delay from Scotland. We're going to be talking about exactly that says, can we want to discuss in this kind of a shoot? Was about supplements and obstacles, which must be a question. You get asked all the time in clinic Helen. Yes, it is because people don't want to take medicines. Do they? They want to get themselves better with diet and Lee. Also, with exercise and nutraceuticals are seen as wellness. They are seen as an extra bonus on the diet. Really, and there was the paper in Public Rheumatology published in 2018, which I'm sure Sophie will put in the show notes which is a meta-analysis of eight systematic reviews in nine randomized, controlled trials. So it sounds quite impressive. But unfortunately the evidence on these nutraceuticals is all quite weak. And so when you look at the evidence, there may be some positive effect behind some of them which include a number of extracts, but one of them is curcumin, which is more well known as turmeric which comes from the Ayurvedic tradition. So there's every reason to suspect that there there is some in anti-inflammatory activity and therapeutic benefit, but it's just quite hard to say what the evidence for that actually is and there is interaction with some anticoagulants. So I think it is always worth having an open discussion about these nutraceuticals. Obviously. The one that's most widely known is glucosamine and chondroitin and nice have now reflected some of the published evidence by saying that no longer is considered effective. There is some evidence that galactolipid extract which is from those hips is quite effective and I have actually been quoting that to patients although fortunately it is quite expensive. It works at about £30 a month and year, that's included in the paper. So I think you have to acknowledge that people Pulmonary hustoplasmosis asymptomatic patients is self-resolving and requires no treatment. However, once symptoms develop a decision to treat needs to be made in mind. Tolerable cases, not treatment other than close monitoring is necessary. However, once symptoms progress to moderate or severe or if there prolongs the greater than 4 weeks trick with center console is indicated. The Anticipated duration is 6 to 12 weeks total. The response should be mounted with a chest x-ray. Furthermore, observation for references necessary for several weeks. Following the diagnosis if the illness is determined to be severe or does not respond to enter cortisol, 
and for tourism B should be initiated for a minimum of two weeks, but up to one year core treatment with methylprednisolone is indicated, improve pulmonary compliance and reduce inflammation, does improving work of respiration. A 33-year-old white female presence after admission to the general medical or surgical hospital ward. With a chief, complaint of shortness of breath on exertion. She reports that she was seen for similar symptoms previously at her primary care, physician's office, six months ago, at that time. She was diagnosed with acute bronchitis and treated with bronchodilators empiric antibiotics and a short course, oral steroid taper. This management did not improve our symptoms and she's gradually worsened over six months. She reports a 20-pound intentional weight loss over the past year. She denies camping, spelunking or hunting activities. She denies any sick contacts. A brief review of system is negative for fever night sweats, palpitation chest pain, nausea, vomiting diarrhea, constipation abdominal pain, neural sensation changes muscular changes and increased bruising or bleeding. She admits a cough shortness of breath and shortness of breath on exertion. I thought you're old women. Ginger isn't a clinic having been diagnosed several years ago with myelitis plastic syndrome MDS, a blood disorder. There is a high chance that the disease will progress to acute myeloid leukemia ML with lower chance of survival. The physicians have started chemotherapy this leads to other treatment decisions and dilemmas which become ethically complex. Ginger has autism spectrum disorder and a small saline nonverbal but a lot with a typical pleasant mood. She seems to enjoy life. Ginger likes to eat favorite foods, watch TV, especially movies, and enjoy her job at a sheltered workshop. She lives in a group home near her parents. She has housemates and 24 by 7 support persons who provide care and transportation. A cognitive level is about that of a preschooler. Ginger's parents are the legal guardians and make all health care decisions. Maggie and Jim are highly involved with a tortoise care and are very concerned that she gets it. Best treatment possible for enemy. Mr. J was a 15-year-old accountant who presented with painful years. He had been aware of sensitivity and tenderness in the upper part of his ears three months previously, but over the preceding six weeks his ears had become very red, and sore here also been aware of some ringing, and feeling of our blocking his ears around a month. Earlier, he had attended the local hospital with red eyes and was diagnosed then, as having epis claret, has he treated with steroid eye drops, which improved his symptoms on further questioning. He told that he had generally felt more tired than usual, and also had intermittent pains in his joints, mainly his wrist finger and knees. He had mild asthma but is otherwise fit and well and was not taking any regular medication biting into the world's hottest pepper. Sounds painful enough, but for one man who entered a chili pepper eating contest, the daring feat was followed by excruciating headaches known as thunderclap headaches. The 34-year-old man ate a Carolina Reaper which is considered the hottest chili pepper in the world. After eating the pepper, the man developed intense pain in his neck and in the back of his head and over the next few days, he went through several episodes of brief but excruciating headaches or thunderclap headaches which strike suddenly and pick within 60 seconds. Doctors determined that the man's setting were caused by a condition known as reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome or CVS in which a person's brain arteries temporarily narrow. This is the first time that doctors have put on a link between eating chili peppers and our CVS. The report said the man's symptoms improved without any specific treatment. Five weeks later another, CT scan short, that his brain arteries had returned to normal, he had no further thunderclap headaches. A boy in Missouri, who had a meat, skewer pierce his face, and get stuck in his head, miraculously survived the injury. The boy 10-year-old Xavier Cunningham was playing in a treehouse, when wasps attacked him causing him to fall off the treehouse ladder and onto a rotisserie skewer that he and his friends had place in the ground. The boy was taken to the hospital. 
where doctors spent hours preparing for delicate surgery to remove the skewer scans of boy's head showed that the skewer had pierced his face and passed just underneath the skull, going all the way to the back of his neck said Dr. Koji Eversole, the director of endovascular neurology at the University of Kansas Health System. She's not the self to document the unusual bunch. Then something even stranger happened the lump moved in a series of self is a woman track. The mysterious lump as it moved across a face, five days after she first noticed a lump, it migrated to above her left eye. Then ten days later, it moved to her upper lip soon. After lump's latest migration, the 32-year-old women went to an eye doctor who also observed a superficial moving oblong nodule at the left upright in other as it turned out that the women had an infection with type of parasitic worm called dera fill area repens these thread like worms naturally in fact dogs cats foxes and other wild mammals and typically leave in the tissue under the skin humans are accidental host in other words not where the worms want to end up and once the worm gets into a human body it typically can't reproduce. The doctor surgically removed to form before it migrated further, when 35 rolls the men arrive at the hospital in France, she told doctors that felt like electric shocks were running down her legs, what's more. She felt weak and had experienced a number of folks recently. The woman's unusual symptoms turned out have a Surprising cause and in Mario reveal additional spina to 926 vertebra, which is located in the middle of the back. The women needed surgery to remove the lesion and tests reveal that was caused by an infection. With a kin of coke is granulosis a small tapeworm that's found in dogs. In some farm animals, including sheep cattle goats, and pigs. This tapeworm can cause a disease called cystic. Ignore Caucasus also known as he'd had two doses in which the larva forms, cysts grow slowly in a puzzle squaddy. This is typically grow in the liver of the lungs, but it can also appear in other parts of the body including the bones and the central nervous system. In addition to surgery, the woman was treated with antiparasitic medication. Nine months later, she had no lingering symptom of infection or signs. That was coming back. An eight-year-old woman presents to a general practitioner with pain and swelling in her left knee. The pain began two days previously and she says that the knee is now hot swollen and painful on movement in the past years. History of mine, osteoarthritis of the hips. She has occasional heartburn and digestion. She had a health check six months previously, and was told that everything was fine except for some elevation of our blood pressure which was once sent to buy 102 m apache and her creatinine level which was around the upper limit of normal the blood pressure was checked several times over the next four weeks and found to be persistently elevated and she i mean by 84 mmhg there is no relevant family history has never smoked in her the last blood pressure reading was one third alcohol consumption averages four units per week. She takes occasional person more for hip pain, nearly three decades ago, a 14-year-old in the United Kingdom. Got hit in the eye during a game of badminton and lost her contact lens. No big deal, right? Well, 28 years later, doctor doctors found the missing contact embedded in a cyst in her left eyelid. It's not like the woman was looking for it the entire time though. Instead at age 42, she visited an ophthalmologist for what she thought was an unrelated problem. Her left eyelid had been swollen and drooping for about six months. And doctors could feel a small lump under the skin. And Maria revealed a well-defined cyst measuring 8 by 4 by 6 millimeters, just above her left. There, doctors in surgically removed the cyst once the cyst was removed. However, it broke open revealing an extremely fragile and hard contact lens inside. Of course the women couldn't immediately recall how the contact lens got there or how long I'd been there. 
But then her mother remembered that the women had been hit in the eye with a shuttlecock 28 years earlier during a game of badminton. Coughing, up blood is an alarming symptom, but it's not particularly rare. Even so one man, California shop is talked to us. When it coughed up an unusual looking blood clot, it was in the shape of S lung. The 36-year-old man was being treated for a serious heart condition. He had chronic heart failure, which means the heart muscle can't pump enough blood to meet the body's normal demands. His condition was, so severe the doctors put him on a machine called a ventricular assist device, which helps the heart pump blood because these machines can also increase the risk for blood clots. He was prescribed a blood thinner medication. However, these medications also increase the risk of bleeding including coughing up. Blood indeed. The patient had several coughing episodes in which he expels small amounts of blood according to the report. But then during an extreme bouts of coughing, the patient spit out an intact cast of the right bronchial tree. In other words, it was a mold cast made of clotted blood in the shape of the lungs. Branched airway passage known as bronchi. It's a curiosity, you can't imagine. I mean, this is very, very, very rare. A man in New York developed, an extremely rare and, fatal brain disorder after heat squirrel brains. According to a report of the man's case in 2015, the 61-year-old man was brought to a hospital in Rochester, New York. After experiencing a decline in his stinking abilities and losing touch with reality, the report said the man had also lost the ability to walk on his own and a Mario of the man said revealed a striking finding the brain scan look, similar to those seen in people with variant Kratzfeld Jacob disease, a fatal brain condition caused by infectious proteins called prions. Only a few hundred cases of Kratzfeld Jacob disease have ever been reported and most part, I took consumption of contaminated, beef in the United Kingdom in the 1980s and 1990s. But in this case, the man had another dietary habit, that could have raised as, risk for VCJD. His family said, he liked to hunt and it was reported that he had eaten squirrel brains. Say darker charity, in a medical resident at Rochester, regional health and lead author of the report. It's unclear the man consumed the entire school brain or just squirrel meat that was contaminated.